Will there be any secret votes by EPP in favour? Oh, we're on. Hello and welcome to Strasbourg. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us um, to this live Q&A with our MEP Jutta Paulus. We're here to talk about the nature restoration law and nature in general, that thing that's keeping us all alive and that is under threat throughout the EU and the world. Uh, Utah, thank you very much for joining us. I know it's a bit of a stressful week ahead of a critical um, uh, vote coming up on Thursday. Tell us a little bit about what is Thursday, what's happening uh, in the NV Committee, the Environment Committee. On Thursday, the Environment Committee will vote on the nature restoration law. This proposal was put forward by the European Commission last year. And it says protection of nature has proven to be not enough. We have to restore nature. We have to revitalize ecosystems. We have to take away pressures from the ecosystems in order to enable them to deliver ecosystem services, such as clean air, drinkable water, fertile soils, our basic necessities. Without those, we cannot exist. So the European Commission, in its biodiversity strategy, has already said we want to halt and reverse biodiversity collapse, the extinction of species, the collapse of ecosystems. And in order to do so, they have put forward this proposal. And actually, it is a good one. It's a good proposal. Of course, it needs some adaptation. But what we have been seeing is a massive campaign by some political groups claiming that this would destroy European economy. But if you look at this law closely, it says we have certain targets for 2030, such as revitalizing a certain percentage of peatlands, such as increasing our pollinator populations, such as making our forests more resilient against climate change, helping us also in climate adaptation. And the member states have a lot of freedom in setting up restoration plans. And we in the parliament have brought in some elements saying this has to be a very inclusive process. Member states have to involve the local communities and the stakeholders, those that are working on the land, in order to find solutions that work for everyone. Okay, so maybe we'll get into the, the opposition and the issues inside the House uh, in, in a bit. But, but first, when people think of nature and the, the trouble everywhere that's happening in our oceans and our forests, they might think it's a very far away thing. It's happening in the Amazon, it's happening in, in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere. What is the state of European nature as it stands now? We know a lot about the state of European nature because um, the European Environment Agency, which is an EU agency where a lot of very dedicated scientists are working in Copenhagen, they brought forward the state of the nature report. And in this report, we have really alarming figures. Every fourth species in Europe is on the red list, many of them threatened with extinctions. 80% of our protected habitats are not in a good condition so that they cannot deliver those services I was talking about or, for example, a forest that should be in good, good shape that has been clear cutting or that the tree species are not diverse anymore. So um, in order to reverse this trend of ecosystems becoming ever worse in their status, we have to work in the opposite, we have to do something to improve their status. And if anyone wants to be depressed, le read the State of the Nature report. It's really devastating. Dear, oh dear. So we have, I forgot to mention at the start, we have, uh, you're, you can ask questions online. Um, we'll be here for the next uh, 20 or, or 30 minutes, depending on how many questions we get in. I will do my best to pick up as many as, as we can um, for Utah. And we have a first question for you, and it comes from Hans. Uh, he asks, uh, with the introduction of this new law, is there any negative impact to be expected for farmers that have already transformed to biological and or regenerative farming? Uh, in my view, these farms must be supported. Farmers who want to make the, this transition should be supported also. What do you think about Han's question? Actually, the law leads exactly in this direction. It aims at supporting farmers which already work hand-in-hand hand with nature using, as you have written, regenerative 
ag agriculture or let's say less intensive practices, having not so many cows on the pasture, but only a number of animals that the pasture can actually support. So there is a lot of indicators which are already would be fulfilled with re regenerative farming. Um, there is a caveat though, and this is on peatlands because if you want to do agriculture on organic soils, you have to drain the soil so that the water goes away. But that means that the organic soil will just be breathed away by microorganisms, meaning that it will emit immense amount of CO2. For example, having dairy cattle on drained peatland emits 40 tons of CO2 per year, whereas a natural peatland actually draws four to eight tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. So if you're an organic farmer working on drained peatland, there needs to be a transformation to an agriculture which actually works on peatland while it is rewetted. There are forms of agriculture that do work in that manner. The Greifswald Meyer Center has been working on this issue for decades, but not every practice will be able to will will be able to perform on with the restoration law when it comes to peatland. So I mean that's maybe the crux of where there are fears of farmers um, across Europe, or at least uh, uh, let's say some farmers, because we know now there's a great divide between uh, the farming communities that support it, the industry and business that support it. We have a question for, for Philippe more directly on that. Will farmers? foresters, fishers with the EU na nature restoration law have a harder time making a living? It depends. Because as I said, the member states have a lot of flexibility. So a member state could decide, let's draw up our restoration plan in a manner that we use funds, be it from the cap, be it from other budgets, to support the farmers that have less yield because their practices are not as intensive as they used to be before. So at the end of the day, it is also a question of funding. And all the farmers I have spoken to, they don't want to be compensated and go home. They want to go on farming, of course. They became farmers because they wanted to farm. So it is not an option to just pay out people and telling them go home and, I don't know, play with your kids or whatever, but to find ways of doing agriculture that is in harmony with nature. So. For example, introducing hedgerows, ponds, little, um, little walls, fruit trees on agricultural land in order to give a home to more species. And if this means um, that you have lower yield, then of course this has to be compensated. It's, for me, it's out of the question that farmers would have be, to be footing the bill. That's not the solution. But is it also a bit of a false... Uh dichotomy, if, if things were to continue in the same way they are now, I mean, what is the future of agriculture if we, if we continue on the current path without making any of these minor adjustments? I think that's part of the problem that people tend to neglect the fact that doing business as usual any longer will end up in having no farming at all. Because if your soil degrades, if there are no live microbes in your soil, if there is drought because you have drained all the peatlands and, and um, tried to get every water out of the landscape, then you will face enormous difficulties, as we are seeing in Spain, in France, in Brandenburg, which is part of my home country, where farmers are having an increasingly hard time to have anything growing there. And climate change will, of course, acerbate the situation. So we have to work against climate change and find nature-based solutions. So you were in Montreal in December. There we had uh, COP15 on biodiversity, which was delayed all through COVID and, and everything else. The EU were very uh, much went into the negotiations saying we have this nature restoration law. What would it mean for the future of, of, of that COP process at international level if, if we don't have this across the line in Europe? That is really scary because, of course, when this agreement was negotiated and there was this claim of saying let's protect 30% of our lands and 10% strictly so that there would be no activity on the strictly protected land. Of course, countries like 
Brazil, like Nigeria, like Kenya, like Indonesia, stood up and said, well, you in Europe, you have destroyed all your old growth forests. You have drained all your peatlands. You have destroyed all your wetlands. Now you're telling us to protect it. Who are you? And then, of course, EU Commission could say, well, we have learned from our mistakes. We now know that we are actually destroying the future possibilities for our farmers, for our foresters, for our population. So we brought forward this law. And if now, not even half a year after Montreal, there would be, let's say, a complete dismissal, a complete rejection of this law, then the whole COP process would be in danger because, of course, the Global South would say, OK, you cannot trust the Europeans, so we better not do anything. OK, then we need to get into the politics of, of what's happening. Why is this being rejected? It, it doesn't seem like uh, being in favour of nature seems like something that everyone would, would get behind, but that's, that's not the case. Um, firstly, on the legislative process, so people understand where are we and what are the next few steps to go okay. for this? In general, legislative process means European Commission comes forward with a proposal. The proposal goes to the European Parliament for negotiations, to the Council of Member States for negotiations. Council is still negotiating. They will probably vote on the 20th. And Parliament has been negotiating until May 31st, when the biggest political group, European People's Party, decided to draw out of the negotiations and told us that uh, their group would vote against the law in any case. And that would mean that this whole process would be stopped, because if Parliament does not have a position of the law, despite complete rejection, then there will be no law, full stop. Not now, not next year, not in the next five years, you think it's game well, of over? Of course, if... the Commission could say, OK, we'll put forward a new proposal, and good luck with that. But we are, now we are in June 2023, one year before the European elections. So if Commission even would do so, which they will not, Mr. Timmermans and also Mr. Sinkovicius were very clear. They said, we have this proposal, please do the democratic procedure, come forward with what you want to have changed, and then we can work on it. Um, but Mr. Timmermans said we simply don't have the time for drawing up a new proposal, mm. which would also mean a new impact assessment, a new stakeholder consultation and all that. So they couldn't just write it down and publish it tomorrow. They would come forward probably in December or something. And then we have just four months before um, the European Parliament goes into election mode. So it's a bit of a make or break moment for nature, but also the Green Deal in general has been on, under this consistent attack uh, and weakening uh, for the last uh, few months, um, particularly from our two bigger groups, the Conservatives and uh, the Liberals. We have a question from Pietro who asks, um, how do you interpret the call by President uh, Emmanuel Macron and uh, de Croo in uh, Belgium to make a pause on European green legislation? Who are they supporting? Which priority and influence groups are they acting for? I think we must differentiate a bit because Macron, um, I really asked a French um, native language speaker and um, also some people I knew from the French delegation um, who knew other people from Marino. And what Macron actually said, he said, let's get on with the legislation we have on the table. Let's not table new ones which is something a bit different in, in, um, instead of insinuating everything has to be drawn back. So he was it's more like... It's not exactly okay. ambitious, though. Pardon? It's not exactly ambitious for the, for the it's next... It's not exactly ambitious, yeah. but let it go as it is right now. I, of course, Macron is also under pressure from industry because industry says, well, less regulation is always beneficial, where I might disagree a bit because a lot of innovation has come through regulation because if you say you have to stop using this or that pollutant in let's say five years time then you give a push to innovation because of course then industry knows okay we'll have to find alternatives and the crew actually was called back from his own government because um, they said, you said biodiversity has to do nothing with climate. May we educate you a bit? Because, of course, without nature, we will not be able to survive the climate crisis. Still, at the NVO, NV vote, we're looking, it's looking a bit dicey. We're maybe three or four MEPs 
uh, turning it either way. And it is predominantly the, the centre-right Conservatives, the EPP, the biggest group in the European uh, Parliament blocking, and Renew, which is where Macron's uh, party comes from and, and, uh, and, and others. Uh, what, what's going on there, do you think, more broadly? Well, I think on Renew, they are split, right? The um, negotiator for Renew, Soraya, she was really, really ambitious. She, she would have liked to have um, a stronger restoration law, even if you look at her amendments, it's very clear. And she was also very disappointed that her group would not follow her approach. Um, on the question why Renew is split, well, they are always split. So we always have this um, heterogeneous approach um, within the Renew uh, group when it comes to, ge in general, environmental protection. I have worked with several Renew members who were very supportive of having more environmental protection, but I have also worked with those who say, let industry do it, they know it best, which is something I would not have really sign up to. So yes, Renew is split as always, and I hope that the, let's say, science-focused um, part would really get the majority. When it comes to EPP, we have, we have a question also from, uh, oh no, sorry, from Bridget, who asks, the false arguments from EPP, which I think are swimming around social media these days, wh what is behind this, and are they already positioning themselves for the elections, do you think? I think it does have something to do with positioning for the elections. Let's not forget that we had this very scary election in the Netherlands where the Farmers' Party, I'll just call them that, I cannot pronounce the, the Netherlands name, um, gained a lot of votes just by saying we're against environmental legislation. And so re I think the EPP thought, OK, that's a topic that people really catch on to, let's use it. Um, then on the, second, on the second side, we have this ongoing feud between Manfred Weber and Ursula von der Leyen. Manfred Weber, who still is not happy that Ursula von der Leyen became commission president and not himself, because he had been Spitzenkandidat of his political group. So he was very, very disappointed. And um, also what I think is a bit of moving in the direction of populist propaganda and that is also something that's scary because by copying the far right you strengthen the far right you do not strengthen your own group so in a follow-up to that question we have another one from uh, uh, nikki who asks how can we stop that polarization and fear that's causing politicians to vote against a law so obviously necessary for all humankind and nature too it's a big question but it's also a bit heartbreaking yes. how do we stop that polarization um I think part of it is already underway. If you have looked at numerous letters by business groups, by a European Central Bank speaking up, saying, hey, you guys, this is about the basis of our economy. No economy can survive without clean water, clean air, fertile soil, something to eat. So we have to make sure that we guarantee this in the long term. So basically, we already have support from, let's say, unusual allies. People that are usually more likely to talk to EPP members and not necessarily to Greens. So that is part of the solution, having a broad coalition saying, hey, we are supporting this law and we're business people and that's why we are supporting it. Because that's an argument for, for EPP members much, much more than if the, the um, usual suspects like BirdLife, WWF, um, all those environmental groups pick up. Um, that is part of the answer. Another part of the answer is ordinary people writing letters, calling at the local assistance offices, saying, hey, we heard that this is on the verge of being rejected. We want it. We want more green in our city. We want more space for our river so the, that we don't have to be afraid um, that we, our house will be underwater when the next heavy rainfall comes. We want this law and we are your voters. That is something that helps, of course, always. And I think what also helps is that we already have those coalitions, for example, between Euroelectric, which is the European power sector generally, and Conservation International, which is a conservancy 
um, organization that is doing restoration. And Euroelectric said, we will consult you before we build things in order to do it biodiversity friendly. And we will chip in money to offset what we are doing to nature because we, you cannot build anything without having any impact. But saying we will help on restoring ecosystems in the vicinity. Yeah. That is something that really helps because it shows it's not an against each other. We are all in this together. Uh, so for pe pe people watching at home, I mean, it's, 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 it's not the rosiest of uh, issues. Uh, and we, if we lose it, it sounds like it could be quite serious. We could bring us back a few years on, on nature protection in Europe. In the next few days, do you think it's wor worthwhile getting in touch with their MEPs who are on the NV committee or...? It's always worthwhile getting in touch with MEPs. I mean, we have this Restore Nature campaign running by the NGOs. We have um, the Write Your MEP campaign from our group. But it's also useful just calling at their offices saying, hey, I, there's something I would like to tell you. And just as an ordinary citizen, saying, I have an interest in protecting pollinators. I have an interest in enabling long-term food security, not just for the next two, three, four years, but for the next 40 years, because I have kids or even grandkids. And also, I think what's also very important is to speak up against those false claims. For example, numerous times I've been asked, well, why don't, do you want to put 10% of agricultural area out of production? This is not in the law. In the law, we have... That was my next question, actually. Oh, OK, so sorry. <laughs> what, 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 what is in the law? Because that's, that is everywhere now. It's yes. being reprinted all, all over the place that we want to get rid of 10% of all uh, agriculture land. So what, what, to clarify once and for all, what's, what's in that law? In that law, we have a figure of 10% high diversity landscape features. We even got rid of the figure in our compromises in order to soothe it a bit. But it was never an obligation and it was never on farm level. But it says, let's aim for having 10% high diversity landscape features on agricultural land in Europe by 2030. You have to have 4% already else you will not be eligible for direct payments in the agricultural policy. So 4% is already there or has to be there. And the remaining 6% can also be funded via the cap or via other budgets. And what is a higher diversity landscape feature? For example, it's an apple tree, or <laughs> it's a fish pond, or it's a hedgerow. So, or it's a, it's a very, it's a grassland where you have only very few cattle grazing. This is also high diversity because you have a lot of herbs and flowers which can thrive and develop there. So having a high diversity landscape feature does not mean that you don't, do not have yields. I mean, if you, for example, usually I don't get apples for free when I go on the market. You can still sell your apples, of course. So it's in no way taking away 10% of each individual farm's land. It's basically retaining some of the features that have been there maybe for hundreds of years anyway, uh, hedges and, and bushes and a and tr few trees. And it's true that um, a lot of these features were cut down in the recent decades. And that's part of the problem we are yeah. facing now. Because if there is no hedgerow where your, um, where your insects can actually hide, or where your birds can breed, um, you have to use more pesticides because you don't have the insects that are eating the pests yeah. because they don't have a home anymore. So basically having those high diversity landscape features could even save a farmer money. And there's this grand uh, study which was done in France um, showing that 40% less pesticides is possible without decreasing yield so that the farmer has more income because he has to buy less pesticides. OK, I'm going to plug. Uh, there, there's a very good, which I only discovered uh, last week. Yuta has done an, a very good fact, uh, fact myth buster, uh, which is now on our website in English. I think it's also in German. And uh, The original was German, so I guess yes. the German one so is also there. It is available uh, on our channels, and you can go through all of the different myths that have uh, been flying up left, right and centre. Uh, Yuta, thank you. 
thanks a lot for joining us. I know it's a very busy week, and thank you all for uh, joining in and for your questions. We need you to help save this very important aspect of the Green Deal, and you can do so by following us on, on all our channels. You'll find our petition there, which will direct you toward NV ministers, NV members of the Environmental Committee this Thursday, and asking them to vote. And also later, um, we'll be uh, asking the Council for a strong position as well. Um, you can follow us on our, on our uh, media channels, as I said, and also sign up to our newsletter um, on our website on greensifa.eu. Uh, Many thanks, and we'll keep you updated as soon as we know the outcome of the vote on Thursday. Thanks a lot. Thank you.